Today, um, I'm going to be talking about verse uh, 17 of Upadesha India. Um, all the verses of um, all, all the verses of Upadesha India are very brief, but um, and there's but there's a lot of meaning packed into them, particularly in the verses from uh, verse 16 onwards, where Bhagavan is dealing with the path of jnana. Um, as we uh, just to get the continuity from last time in verse 16, which is the first in this series of verses dealing with the path of jnana, Bhagavan gives a very succinct and practical definition of what is real awareness. That is, he says, leaving external phenomena, veli vishayangal, um, the mind knowing its own form of light alone is real awareness. The mind's own form of light is the light of um, of pure awareness, the aware, the, our fundamental awareness, I am, which is what illumines the mind and thereby enables it to know all other things. But instead of using the, the, that light to know other things, if the mind turns back to face the original light, you know, to face its own source, um, it will merge in that. And that is what Bhagavan describes as the state of real awareness. Um, obviously, when the mind turns away from all other things, it thereby leaves all external phenomena. So the normal, the, the natural direction of the mind is to flow outwards towards things other than itself. Because only when our attention is on things other than ourself, are we what seems to be the mind or ego. When we turn our attention back towards ourself, no such thing as mind or ego is found. All we find is what we actually are, which is the light, uh, our own form of light, as Bhagavan describes it, which is itself real awareness. So verse 16 is a very practical definition of real awareness, of what we actually are. Awareness is what we actually are. So that the real awareness that we actually are, how we can experience it, that Bhagavan not only defines what it is, but also indicates what is the practice, that is, we have to leave all other, leave, cease being aware of all other things and attend only to our own form of light, to our own uh, fundamental awareness. Then we merge in that fundamental awareness and that state in which we alone, we remain only as that pure awareness, that is the state of real awareness. So in continuity of that, Bhagavan uh, goes on to verse 17 that is in verse 16 he talks about the mind knowing its own form of light um so what is this mind that is what we need to investigate and so in the verse 17 bhagavan says uh, teaches us what happens if we investigate ourselves keenly if the mind investigates itself keenly enough if that is if we as mind investigate ourselves keenly enough what he says in verse 17 is Manatin Uruve, Maravadu Chava, Manamenum Ondrile Undipara, Markum Neracum, Neracum Idundipara. Um, Undipara has no special meaning here, so, but, but, so the rest of the verse is Manatin Uruve, Maravadu Chava. That means when, when one investigates the form of the mind without uh, forgetting, Manam enum ondrile, there is no such thing as mind. Markam nerakam idu, this is the direct path for, akam means for everyone, for who, whomsoever. Uh, um, uh, firstly, um, in, in the, the first clause, manatin uruve maravadu chava, Uchaba means uh, when one investigates. Um, Maravadu means um, that is the neg it, it's a negative um, adverbial participle. So it means without or not um, uh, uh, forgetting. That is, the verb mara means to forget, to neglect, to, um, to uh, disregard. Or, or to uh, give up. So we can also take that if we investigate the form of the mind without giving up, without ceasing. Um, but the, the more specific meaning is without neglecting, that is without uh, 
without ceasing to be self-attentive, without forgetting that our aim is just to know what we ourselves actually are. So we need to uh, uh, um, attend to ourselves uninterruptedly. And uh, the implication is very keenly. So when we investigate ourselves without forgetfulness and without interruption, and what is it we're investigating? He says, manatin urube. That means the form of the mind. So what does he mean by the form of the mind? We can explain it in um, either of two ways, both of which ultimately mean the same. That is, in the previous verse, he talked about the manam tan oliuru, the mind's own form of light. That is, the light, light there is a, a metaphor for awareness. So the, the mind's own uh, light of awareness. So what the mind... What the mind essentially is, is just that light of awareness, of the pure awareness, the fundamental awareness of our own existence, I am. Um, so that is one way we can interpret manatin or the form of the mind, the essential form of the mind is just that pure awareness. So if we investigate that, uh, the, the, the chit aspect of uh, that is mind or ego is chit jadagranti. It is a not formed, by the entanglement of chit, which is pure awareness, with uh, the body, which is non-aware, jada. So um, when we are investigating ourselves, we are disregarding the jada portion. That's all the jada portion, the adjuncts, are what Bhagavan described in the previous verse as veli uh, videngal, their external uh, phenomena. Um, when he says external, He's not talking about just phenomena that are outside the body. Everything other than ourself is external to ourself. In that sense, he uses the term external. So all phenomena are external in that sense. So we need to leave all phenomena, he says, all, all external phenomena. Leaving external phenomena means not attending to them, They're ceasing to be aware of them by turning our entire attention back towards ourself. Um, so if in, in this, um, in the, the, as I say, the, the uh, jada portion in the, uh, in, in the chit jada granti, that is the mind, the, uh, um, uh, the body and um, uh, life, uh, mind, intellect and will, all these five sheaths, these are all jada, they're all things other than ourself. Um, so we need to, this, uh, disregard all of them and attend only to the chit aspect of the mind, to the awareness aspect. Um, so in that sense, Bhagavan talks about the manatin urube, the form of the mind. It means the, the chit swarupa, the, 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 the real uh, chit form of the mind. That is one way we can explain manatin urube. Um, another way we can explain this is in uh, in terms of the next verse, which we'll discuss more in more detail next month, but which I'll just briefly go through now, because it um, it it is relevant to the meaning. It's clarifying the meaning of this verse. That is what he says in verse eighteen: "Is enangale manum, that's um, thoughts alone are the mind. Yabinum, that means of all. That means implies of all thoughts. Nana enum ename mulamam." The thought called I is the root. So though, though the term mind is often used as a collective term, as a collective name for uh, referring to all the, the totality of all thoughts, all other thoughts are constantly changing. The one constant thought, that is, so long as there is mind, the one thought that is constant is the, what he refers to here as the thought called I. The thought called I um, is, is another term for ego. So the, the ego, the I, I is, the, um, is, the, is the root of all the other thoughts. That is, all other thoughts are objects, things known by us, whereas I is the subject, the knower. So the, what he refers to as the thought called I is the, the thinking thought, the thought that thinks all other thoughts. That is, um, that is ego. So that is the root. So since that is the root, and other, all, since all other thoughts are constantly changing, and the one constant root is this thought called I, 
he concludes this verse saying, Yanam manam enal. That means what is called the mind is just, is I. I here refers to this the, the ego, this thought called I. So the implication of verse 18 is though the term mind is used to refer to um, many thoughts, what it um, what the mind essentially is, is just ego, the first thought called I. So we can take in, so the essential form of the mind, we can take in verse uh, uh, 17, which we're discussing now, when he talks about investigating the form of the mind, we can, he's talking not about all the other thoughts, he's talking about the first thought I. So if we investigate the, uh, when we investigate the first thought I, that is the essence of the mind, um, we'll find there's no such thing as mind at all. So as I say, there are two ways we can interpret manatinuru. We can either take it to mean the manam the oliyuru referred to in the previous verse, or the thought called I referred to in the following verse. These, though these may seem to be two different interpretations, in practice they are one and the same. Because what this the thought called I is ego. What the ego essentially is, if we discard all the adjuncts, what remains is just that pure awareness. So when we are attending to ego, what we are actually attending to is pure awareness. We can understand this um, with the help of the snake rope analogy. If we um, see a rope and mistake it to be a snake, what is the way to see what it actually is? We have to look at it very carefully. If we look at it very carefully, we will see that it's not actually a, a snake, it is only a rope. So um, likewise, if we look very carefully at the ego, we'll see that it's not actually ego, it is just pure awareness. So whether we interpret manatinuruve as referring to ego, the essential form of the mind, or to the oliuru, which is the essence of ego, in both both interpretations amount to the same in practice. So uh, so that's the first clause, Manatin Urve Maravad Chava. When one investigates the form of the mind without forgetting or without neglecting. Manam enum ondrile, he says in the next clause, the main clause of this sentence, uh, there is um, um, <clears throat> Uh, one thing called mind doesn't exist, or there's no such thing, there's no uh, thing, such thing as mind is uh, the implication of this clause. Manomeno mondrile, there's, there's no thing, no, no such thing at all as mind. Um, uh, again, we can understand this uh, uh, in terms of the snake, um, with the aid of this analogy, the snake rope analogy. If you if we mistake a rope to be a snake, and, but we want to, but we we are told that this is not actually a snake; it's only a rope. We're still not entirely convinced because we, to us it still looks like a snake. So, what is the way to see what it actually is to investigate it? We need to look at it very carefully. If we look at the snake carefully enough, we'll see there's no such thing as there's no such thing as a snake at all there. I mean, there there is no snake there. There is only uh, just a rope. Likewise, if we investigate the form of the mind or ego keenly enough, we will see there's no such thing at all. But what actually is there is only the pure awareness. What he, he referred to in the previous verse as uh, the oliuru, the form of light, that is the light of pure awareness, which is our, which we always experience as our fundamental awareness of our own existence. That is, there is never a moment when we are not aware of ourselves as I am. The problem is, when we rise as ego, we are not aware of ourselves just as I am. We're aware of ourselves as I am this or I am that. I am this body. So um, it's, it's that fundamental awareness when mixed with adjuncts see, is what seems to be mind or ego. If we remove the adjuncts and look at it closely, we'll see that it's just pure awareness. So that's why Bowen says, and one investigates the form of the mind without um, without uh, forgetting or without neglecting, there's no such thing as mind at all. Um, this, this is one of Bhagavan's, that in many places Bhagavan says, for example, in verse 25 of Uludunapadu, 
he 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 describes the nature of ego. Firstly, he describes ego as uruvatra um, payahandeya, um, formless phantom ego. So how do a formless phantom? It's got it's neither got form. Uh, it, but it's formless and if it's a phantom it's got no substance so it's neither got form nor substance so it doesn't actually exist is the implication of uh, when Bhagavan refers to it as a formless phantom he, the implication is that there's no such thing at all but how does this non-existent um, ego come into existence if he, he explains that if this isn't explaining the cause of its arising, but the cause of its arising cannot be explained since it is the first cause. There's no, there's no cause preceding it. But he says, when Urupatri um, Undam, uh, uh, grasping form, it comes into existence. Urupatri Nikkam, grasping form, it stands. Urupatri Undu Mika Ongam, grasping and feeding on form, it, uh, it flourishes abundantly. So this is the nature of ego. The nature of ego is always to grasp form. Since ego itself is a formless phantom, all the forms that it grasps are things other than itself. But the first form it grasps is the form of a body, which it mistakes to be itself. Um, so this is the nature of the ego. But Bhagavan doesn't stop there. He, he says, Uruvittu Urupatram, leaving one form, it grasps another form. So the nature of mind is to be always grasping form. But then he, he says, Tedinal um, Otum Pidicum. If sought, it takes flight. What did this mean? That is, when we are, so long as we're grasping form, that is, so long as we're attending to anything other than ourselves, <coughs> we seem to be this ego. But when we turn our attention back towards ourselves and try to grasp ourselves alone, that's try to attend, gr grasping here means, uh, attending to and being aware of <coughs> how does ego grasp form by attending to it and being aware of it <coughs> so when we try to attend to ourselves to be aware only of ourselves since we are formless since we as ego are formless we've got no form to hold on to without a form to hold on to ego uh, subsides and dissolves back into its source so that's why he said, Bhagavan says, when, we, uh, when sought, it takes flight. Why does it take flight? Because it doesn't actually exist, as he clarifies in this verse 17 of Upadesha Undia. If we investigate it, if we look very carefully at the snake, the snake runs away. Why does the snake run away? Because it, there never was a snake there. Saying it, when Bhagavan says, when sought, it takes flight, that term, it takes flight, Otumpidicum is a metaphorical way of saying it disappears. Why does it disappear? Because it was never actually there. Just like if we look carefully at an, enough at the rope, at the snake, to see what it actually is. If we see that it's just a rope, the snake at once disappears. The snake takes flight, metaphorically we can say. Why does it take flight? Because it was never actually there. It was only an appearance, an illusory appearance. Likewise, the mind or ego is just an illusory appearance. We, we seem to be mind or ego so long as we're aware of anything other than ourselves. When we turn our attention back to ourselves to see what we actually are, when we investigate uh, ourselves without uh, forgetfulness, as he says here, that means when we investigate ourselves very keenly and without allowing our attention to be distracted away towards anything else, we will find there's no such thing as mind at all, because what is there? There is only that oliuru, the form of light, the pure awareness, I. Um, so, what, um, so what Bhagavan says here, Manameno Mandrile, this clarifies what he means in verse 25 and also in so many other places, and particularly in verses of rules in Africa, there are many verses in which Bhagavan in, uh, implies that ego will uh, disappear if we investigate it. Um, and so this verse clarifies why it will disappear. It disappears because it doesn't actually exist. It's merely a false appearance. If we look at it keenly enough to see what it, what is it that is appearing as this e mind or ego, we will see just that it, it is just pure awareness, that there never was actually any mind or ego at all. And then he concludes this verse 17 by saying, uh, 
Makum, uh, 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 makum ne akum idundi para. This is for everyone a direct path. The um, uh, makum is a Tamil form of the Sanskrit word maga, which means path or road or way or means. Um, the word ne, direct, um, it it, it means direct, straight, appropriate, or um, the, the true part. If, if you talk about a person who is honest and straightforward, you talk about them as a, as a nair, as, as straight. So it, it implies what is honest, what is straight, what is appropriate, and, and what is direct. So this is the direct path for everyone. Why is this the direct path? Because in any other form of spiritual practice, Instead of attending to ourself, we're attending to something other than ourself, whether it be a name or form of God, or whether it be some point in the body, a chakra, or whether we're meditating on trying to be mindful in the present moment or attending to everything that's happening. Or what, and there are so many different forms of meditation. But all forms of meditation, other than self-investigation, entail attending to something other than ourselves. Attending by it, so long as we're attending to anything other than ourselves, we are we are sustaining ego because ego is what we seem to be. So long as we're aware of anything other than ourselves, so we we will continue to uh, 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 appear as ego, seem to be ego, so long as we are aware of anything other than ourselves. So. So by attending to anything other than ourselves, by meditating on anything other than ourselves, we are um, sustaining the, uh, the false appearance of ourself as ego. So in order to get rid of this ego, in order to see what we actually are, the direct means is to look at ourselves directly. Looking at anything else isn't going to reveal to us what we actually are. Um, all other things are just... Uh, they may, as Bhagavan says in verse 26 of Urudhunaptu, ego comes into existence, everything comes into existence. If ego doesn't exist, everything doesn't exist. Ego itself is everything. So all the phenomena we see are nothing but an expansion of ego. When we rise as ego, we project all these phenomena. So in essence, everything is just ego. But so long as we are looking at anything other than ourselves, anything other than the uh, oliyur, the fundamental light that we actually are, the light of awareness that illumines all these things, so long as we can get anything other than that, we seem to be ego, and so the, the awareness of things other than ourselves sustains our existence as ego. So though everything is ultimately ego, it's only when we attend to the chit aspect of ego, the essential chit aspect of ego, as Bhagavad often used to refer to it, that is the essential awareness aspect, to, to just to be a fundamental awareness I am, then, then only uh, that's the only means by which we can know ourselves. So long as we attend to anything other than ourselves, we will continue to seem to be this ego. And so long as we have, seem to be ego, we are not aware of ourselves as we actually are. In order to be aware of ourselves as we actually are, we need to cease being aware of ourselves as ego. In order to cease being aware of ourselves as ego, we need to cease being aware of anything other than ourselves. Because it's only as ego that we are aware of things other than ourselves. In sleep, when we don't rise as ego, there is nothing other than ourself for us to be aware of. In waking and dream, we rise as ego and all these other things appear. That's what Bhagavan uh, points out in, um, in verse 26 of Uludhunaptu. Though verse 26 of Uludhunaptu seems to be an extremely radical teaching, but only when we rise as ego to all other things come into existence, it's actually our experience. It's only, we exist as ego when? In waking and in dream. So long as we exist as ego, other things seem to exist. When we don't rise as ego, as in sleep, no other things exist. That's our experience. It's when, when we, uh, when, when ego rises in waking and dream, then we think, oh, 
um, I was asleep and while I was asleep, the world was continuing. But that wasn't our experience when we were asleep. When we were asleep, our experience was I alone am, nothing else is at all. So um, what Bhagavan points out in verse 26 of Golden Avenue, though it, it's very radical, it turns all our beliefs on their head. Um, uh, it, it challenges all our most fundamental beliefs about everything. Uh, it's actually, he's just pointing out to us what is actually our own experience. The trouble is, though it's our experience, but when we rise as ego, other things come into, ex other things appear to exist. When we don't rise as ego, nothing else appears to exist. Though this is our experience, we misinterpret our experience because when we rise as ego, we take a body to be I. So long as we experience a body as to be I, this body seems to be real. Since this body seems to be real, and since this body is a part of this world, the whole world seems to be real. So, so long as we are seeing this world, it seems to us to be real. So it seems, so because it seems to us to be real now, we assume that it continues, even when we're not aware of it, as in sleep. But Though we assume that, there's no, absolutely no evidence for that. So it is not actually our experience that the world continues to exist in sleep. It is a groundless assumption. So that's what Bhagavan points out to us. So we must, that's why Bhagavan often said, in this path, it's not a matter, there's not a lot to learn. It's more a matter of unlearning than of learning. We need to be ready to completely change our view of, um, of everything. We need to uh, see everything in a fresh light, to cease assuming that all these things exist independent of our perception of them, to recognize that this, our entire waking state and all that we know in the waking state, all our science, our history, our geography, our politics, everything, it's all nothing more than a dream. Um, so we must be willing to accept that if we want to go deep in Bhagavan's uh, teachings. So. Uh, I, I'm going a bit away from this verse, but uh, because this verse is dealing with the very core of Bhagavan's teachings, it's connected with so many other aspects of his teachings. So, um, as I say, he concludes this verse by saying it's the direct path for everyone, because attending to anything other than ourselves, by attending to other things, for example, by meditating with love on a name or form of God, we thereby gradually purify the mind. And when the mind, only when the mind is purified to a certain extent, will it be willing to accept that this is the direct path, that in order to know ourselves, in order to know what the reality of all that we see, including the reality of God, uh, the only way to know the reality of all these things is to know the reality of ourself, the seer. And in order to know the reality of ourself, the seer, we need to attend to ourselves. So what Bhagavan says here is simple logic. The direct way to know ourselves is to attend to ourselves. Is the implication? Attending to anything other than ourselves, such as meditating with love on the name and form of God, that may be an indirect way in the sense that it will purify the mind and eventually lead the mind to a, a state of purification in which it's ready to accept, but to know God to know the truth of the world, to know the truth of everything, we need to know ourselves. And to know ourselves, we need to attend to ourselves. So whatever other spiritual path we may follow, ultimately all other spiritual paths can come to an end only when they lead to this path, because only this path will lead us to the goal. That's why Bhagavan said, this is the direct path. So, um, there are so many, um, in, in the vast um, uh, Ganga um, basin, there, there were water flowing from the um, Himalayas and other mountains surrounding the, um, the, the North Indian plain where the Ganga flows through. All those rivers flow into the Ganga. Even the Yamuna flows into the Ganga. It's only the Ganga that flows directly into the ocean. So if we want to reach the ocean, we have to join the Ganga. The Ganga is, so to speak, the direct path to the ocean. The Ganga flows directly to the ocean. All other rivers, they flow into the Ganga 
And once they join the Ganga, then they flow into the ocean. So the, the path of self-investigation is the direct path to reach the ocean of Satchitananda, the ocean of infinite being, awareness, and happiness. So all other paths can are indirect because they cannot lead us directly to the ocean. They can only lead us to this to the Ganga, the Ganga of self-investigation. When we investigate ourselves, then only can we know what we actually are and reach the ocean of Satchitananda, which is what we always actually are. So this alone is the direct path. Um, before leaving this verse, there are just two points I'd like to say about how Bhagavan's teachings are, um, are misunderstood, misinterpreted by people. That is, because Bhagavan taught us that there's no such thing as mind, there's no such thing as ego, there are many would-be gurus nowadays who say, you are already that, there is no ego, there's, you've, there's nothing, all you need to see is that there's no ego, and then, um, then you can live your life um, perfectly happily. Um, if we see that there's no ego, if we actually see that there's no ego, there would be no life for us to live. That is, when, if there's... When ego doesn't exist, everything doesn't exist, as Bhagavan said. So when, when we experience the state of egolessness, there will be no world, no body, no mind, nothing. There will be, and then not only will there be no mind, but Bhagavan doesn't say um, in this verse, the mind will cease to exist. He says there is no such thing as mind at all. So in, when, we when we know ourselves as we actually are, it's not as if previously we were mistaking ourselves to be mind. Now we know what we actually are. When we know ourselves what we actually are, as we actually are, we will know that we were never mind. We were never, there was never any such thing as mind or ego. We were always aware of ourselves as we actually are. And what we actually are is immute, is pure awareness, which is immutable. It never undergoes any change whatsoever. So it's not as if there was once ignorance and now there is knowledge. When we attain that knowledge, we'll find there never was any ignorance at all. But so long as we are aware of anything other than ourselves, any phenomena, any multiplicity, what is aware of all these things is only ourself as ego. So simply saying, oh, there is no ego is it's not of any use. Right? That is why Bhagavan teaches us that there's no such thing as mind or ego. He's telling us what we need to, what we will discover if we investigate ourselves. But so long as we mistake ourselves to be this body, we who mistake ourselves to be this body and who are consequently aware of other things, we are ego. So Though ego or mind doesn't actually exist at all, it seems to exist. And so long as it seems to exist, all these problems seem to exist. That's why, though Bhagavan taught us that there is no such thing as mind or ego at all, in most of his works, he's discussing only this mind or ego, because my, that is, if Bhagavan simply said, oh, there's no mind, that's not helpful to us. So long as we mistake ourselves for your mind, simply being told there's no mind, how to get rid of this mind? How? Okay, mind doesn't actually exist, but it seems to exist. But there's actually no snake at all there. But so long as there seems to be a snake, it's causing us fear and causing us problems. We want to walk along this path in the, in the, in the, in the, the dim light of dusk, but we can't because there's a snake there on the path. So it's causing fear, it's delaying our journey, it's creating so many problems. So in order to get to overcome this problem, we need to look very carefully at the snake and see that it's only a rope. When we see what it actually is, we will see there never was any snake and there never was any grounds for fear. There was never any need to uh, delay our, our, our journey to wherever we were walking. So likewise, so long as there seems to be this mind or ego, we have a problem. How to get rid of this problem? Only by looking, investigating what is the root of all our problems. All problems are for whom? For ourself as ego, for ourself as mind. When we don't raise this mind in waking, in sleep, there are no problems. All problems come into existence in waking and dream when we raise this mind. So the root of all problems 
is this ego or mind? This is what we need to investigate. If we investigate it, we'll find it doesn't actually exist. But simply saying it doesn't exist without investigating it is of no use. Why Bhagavan says it doesn't exist? To make us understand how, how necessary it is for us to investigate it. Because if we investigate it and find it doesn't exist, then all other problems don't exist. Because all other problems exist only for mind or ego. So, um, so when Bhagavan says here, but there's no such thing as mind, this, as I say, this is often misinterpreted by people. Bhagavan, Bhagavan doesn't deny the, uh, the seeming existence of mind. He denies that the mind actually exists. So, so long as the mind seems to exist, we have a problem. And to, to, to analyze that problem we have, Bhagavan has written works like Uludunapadu, in which he explains that everything comes into existence only because of his ego. His ego itself is the, is the root of everything. The, 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 the root problem, the cause of all problems is ego. Because what is ego or mind? It is the subject. Everything else, all, all our problems, all phenomena, they're all objects. Objects seem to exist in whose view? Only in the view of the subject. So the subject is the, is the root of all these things. If we investigate the subject, all the subject will disappear, along with it all objects will disappear, and what will remain is what we actually are, which is pure Satchitananda. That is um, one way in which the important teaching that Bhagavan gives us in this verse is very, um, very often misinterpreted and trivialized by many would-be gurus. The other aspect is this Bhagavan in this verse coined this term direct path, Markham uh, uh, Ne Margam, uh, Markham Ne, um, the direct path. So Bhagavan coined this term. This term is now has now been picked up by many um, of these um, would-be gurus nowadays, the neo the neo Advaita persuasion, and. Uh, um, they use this term direct path without connecting it with uh, they they say oh the direct path is just to see but there's no mind at all that's all they they don't or even some of them talk about direct paths as if there's more than one direct path um they say my teaching is also a direct path Bhagavan says this is the direct path well, there's no the in tamil but it's, the, it's what's implied there this is the one and only direct path because attending to anything other than ourself can cannot be anything be better i mean a very best a very most it is an indirect path to know what we actually are it cannot be a direct path so um the, the, the important teachings that Bhagavan gives us in this verse are very e are very easily trivialized by or very um carelessly trivialized by people who don't have a deep understanding of Bhagavan's teachings. So we need to understand Bhagavan's teachings, each individual teaching in the context of the whole. So just because Bhagavan says here, there's no such thing as mind, doesn't mean that um, if, if there's no such thing as mind, then why does he write so much about mind or ego in, in other places? Because he acknowledges, even in the first clause of this verse, um, he implies that there is a seeming mind. Because he says when one investigates the form of the mind, it's only when we investigate the form of the mind that we then find that there's no such thing, uh, uh, there's not anything called mind. There's no such thing as mind at all. But we need to investigate it first. Um, so this, as I say, this is a very, very, this is one of the most important verses of Bhagavan's teachings because he summarizes the whole of his teachings in this verse. All his teachings are about is investigating what we actually are. How we have risen as mind or ego. So let us investigate ourselves. If we investigate ourselves keenly enough, we'll find there's no such thing as mind at all. What is actually there is only pure awareness. He doesn't say that here, but if the the implication, particularly coming after the previous verse in which he explained that knowing our own form of light, that is true awareness. Um, so Bhagavan has, in, as I say, in this verse, Bhagavan gives the, the very essence of his teachings. Um, he's, he summarizes the, 
the practical import of, uh, for example, verse 25 of Urunapadu, in which he, he taught us that the nature of ego is to rise and stand and flourish by attending to things other than ourselves, by grasping form, as he calls it, and to, uh, to, uh, to disappear as soon as we try to grasp ourselves, as soon as we try to investigate ourselves. Um, so uh, Bhagavan in this verse clarifies that teaching and, uh, and summarizes it in a nutshell. So um, does anyone have any questions I'd like to ask about this very important verse? Thank you, Michael. Um, so I just posted in the chat box and if you have any questions pertaining to this verse, um, please go ahead and, and post it there. Um, so Michael, um, there's one um one of the uh, one of the points uh, that um that that um that i was thinking about was when he where he says um yarkum mm. for all yes um and uh, this this uh, the, the people struggled with it like you know even during bhagwan's times people struggled with it like uh, i was um, there was an incident um incidents there were some incidents that i was reading about um, where apparently some peasants walked into Bhagwan um, and asked some questions, and Bhagwan uh, told them to, you know, um, to to investigate and and found out who they are. And then after the peasants left, um, I think it was um, uh, Kavya Kanta uh, and uh, and uh, was uh, you know, talking to somebody else. So why does Bhagwan do that? Uh, you know, how will the present peasants understand this? You know, uh, things of that nature. So I always used to wonder. Uh, I think education doesn't have anything to do with this. No. Um, yeah. You know, uh, this is for everyone. And I think this is, uh, this is a lot of people struggled with it, even when Bhagwan was in his body and, and now. And I think that's something that uh, everyone needs to, to clearly understand. Yeah. If, that it is for all. If we are, if we are walking along a, a path in the dim light and we see what seems to be a snake there, the direct way to, um, to, to remove that fear of a snake is to look at it carefully and see that it's just a rope. That is the direct path. But there are many people who will be too afraid to look at the snake. They don't want to look at the snake. They're too afraid. So though it is the direct path for everyone, it doesn't mean that everyone is ready to follow it. So there are, that is this, this path, as, as you say in that incident, yes, Bhagavan taught this simple path to even the most uneducated people. There was a, there was a simple uneducated woman from a village called Deso, called Akilandamaya. She used to come um, regularly to Bhagavan, and whenever she came, she would cook food and offer to Bhagavan. She was a very simple, uneducated woman. She didn't understand, I mean, she knew Bhagavan was teaching something, but she wasn't really concerned about Bhagavan's teaching. Because she, for her, she had love for Bhagavan, she wanted to serve him. But one day, she felt she wanted to have some teachings from Bhagavan, because she saw Bhagavan was, was answering so many questions that people were asking. So he asked her, sorry, she asked him, uh, Bhagavan, please give me some, some teaching. He, the teaching he gave is, uh, vidamal iru, that is, be without leaving yourself. He, he summarized the whole of his teachings in those three simple words, be without leaving yourself. Without leaving yourself means without ceasing to be self-attentive is the implication. So even to most uneducated people, Bhagavan gave his teachings. Why? Because his teachings are so simple. It's actually, to tell the truth, it is easier for the simple uneducated people to understand Bhagavan's teaching because their mind are not, are not filled with a lot of complicated ideas. For Kaviyaganta was quite the opposite of those villagers. He was very, very well uh, read. He had he had studied he had studied Vedas and Upanishads and so many texts and tantras and so many books, he, yoga and he was he had studied so much. Yet in spite of all his learning, he couldn't grasp Bhagavan's teachings. 
Why? Because he was unwilling to grasp them, because he had so many complicated beliefs. And he, the, the simplicity of Bhagavan's teachings didn't appeal to him at all. Uh, Bhagavan himself told Lakshman Sharma that when, after um, Nana was first uh, published, um, there was a, um, a Telugu devotee um, uh, called um, Pranavananda. He was actually the same, um, he was um, the person who was the, um, who was the, Telugu, who was the Telugu Munchi uh, for uh, F.H. Humphreys when he was uh, serving in the police in Belor. So he was the one who brought F.H. Humphreys to Bhagavan. Uh, later he became a sannyasi called Pranavananda. He translated, um, he, he, was, he knew Tamil and, uh, and Telugu very well. Um, oh, and he was also the, uh, I think, the uncle and the stepfather of, um, of the future um, president of India, so uh, a famous philosopher, Savapali uh, Radhakrishnan. Um, he translated uh, Nana from Tamil into Telugu. And after translating it, he showed it to Kavyaganta to, to, because he, he, was, he regarded Kavyaganta as a very great scholar. So he thought he would be able to uh, improve on the Telugu. So Kavyaganta read it and returned and said, I do not like this at all. I never thought Bhagavan would be guilty of partiality. Bhagavan himself told this story to Lakshman Shama in a particular context. And he told him they hated a Dwaita like poison because they had so many beliefs about um, Kavyaganta and his followers. They had so many beliefs about uh, they wanted to get Shakti and Siddhis and to drive the British out of India and to reestablish the Vedic Dharma. They even had a, a plan for a world government with the capital in, um, they wanted to build a city around Arunachal in the form of a Sri Chakra, and Bhagavan would be the emperor. And they would all have, um, he had decided who would be governor of Europe, who would be governor of America. He had everything <laughs> planned out. So when he had so many complex plans and uh, ambitions, Bhagavan's simple, simple teachings, which are good for uh, uneducated villagers and simple people like us, <laughs> they didn't appeal to him at all. So we don't need to be learned or, or to have, um, have, yeah, we don't need the great education or anything. We simply need to understand who is there who isn't aware of themselves as I am. We all are aware of ourselves as I am. Leave without leaving yourself. <laughs> Cling to that I am, that will save you. So Bhagavan's teachings are so, so, so simple. But it's, Bhagavan's teachings are not difficult to understand. They're extremely simple to understand. They're difficult to accept. And because people are unwilling to accept them, unwilling to accept their extreme simplicity, they have difficulty understanding them. No, when Bhagavan said, when ego comes into existence, everything comes into existence. Obviously, he doesn't mean like that, because obviously the world does exist. So it's when the ego comes into existence, then you become aware of the world. They try to dilute what the, the simple teachings of Bhagavan, they try to twist and dilute because they're not willing to accept it. So though this is the direct path for everyone, only those who are ready to accept it will follow it. It is the direct path for everyone, but you can take a horse to water, you cannot make it drink. Bhagavan offered this simple teaching to whoever came to him. When people ask Bhagavan questions, he always, first he tried to turn them back to himself. Who is asking these questions? For whom are all these problems? When he, only when people were not ready to accept that, then Bhagavan would come down in other teachings which are suitable for, according to their level of maturity. Because the immature mind will not be willing to accept the simplicity of the uh, both the simplicity of Bhagavan's philosophy and the simplicity of the practice. Because just as the Bhagavan's philosophy is extremely simple, is the practice. But I mean, Bhagavan didn't teach it. Or the philosophy that Bhagavan taught us wasn't just for the take, take of philosophy. Bhagavan's teachings are, are, are 
uh, wholly practical. So whatever philosophy he taught us was for a practical purpose. So his teachings are extremely, um, yeah, uh, just like the uh, philosophy is extremely simple, the practice is extremely simple, but it takes a simple heart to accept it. Um, so the more we, the, the simpler our understanding, the, sim the clearer it will be. I, I don't know, there's a, they, often people quote what um, uh, Jesus, I think, said at some point in the Bible. I, I, I don't know, I'm, I'm not very familiar with it, but I think at one point he said, unless you become like little children, you will not enter the kingdom of, um, of God, something to that effect. What, how I would interpret that, according to Bhagavan's teaching, is becoming like little children means being extremely simple, being willing to understand Bhagavan's simple teachings at face value, as they, as they actually are. If ego comes into existence, everything comes into existence. If ego is not, everything is not. Ego itself is everything. Therefore, investigating what this ego is, is giving up everything. So, so simple. That's verse 26. So, I mean, Bhagavan has expressed his teachings time again, 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 in such simple ways. I mean, his teachings couldn't be simpler, but still people are not able to grasp them because they're, because they're not ready to simplify their understanding of the whole of life. There are so many big problems in the world. How can, how can this simple self-investigation solve all these problems? See all the, justices in the injustices in the world. See all the, the coronavirus and the wars and the, um, and the political, the politics and the injustices. So many problems are there in the world. And science has been investigating all these things and learning so much about quarks and, um, and quantum this and that and so many everything is so complicated how can it be so simple like Bhagavan says but if ego comes into existence all these things come into existence if we are not it, it's all the matter of willingness if we're willing to accept what Bhagavan says it is true in, in our experience everything all this science all this politics all this history and geography and everything comes into existence only when we wake up in the morning in waking and dream, all these things seem to exist. In sleep, they don't seem to exist. According to Bhagavan, they don't exist except in our perception of them. So they seem to exist only when we see them, only when we are aware of them. When we, when we look only at ourselves and not at all these other things, we will see that we alone exist and then there is nothing else. So Bhagavan's teachings are so, so simple. But are we willing to accept are we willing to simplify our whole view of life? Are we willing to, to give up our, our, our mistaken view and accept this very, very simple view? Until we are willing to accept this simple view, we will not be willing to go deep in this path of self-investigation. Right. Thank you, Michael. Um, Rabbi, you want, uh, you want to go ahead with the question? Rabbi? Sure. Go ahead. Uh, thank you, Michael. As always, it's uh, it's always uh, good to get reinforcement of, of Bhagavan's teaching from your talk. And so, listening to you uh, I, and practicing self attention, uh, I can see how one can get a feel that uh, you are the awareness and not your body. And even that the world is nothing but a thought in the event. Yes. However, how did Bhagwan teach about how to go from the individual awareness to one Satchitananda? Our experience is that we can never hitch our awareness to someone else's physical and mental pain. So if I'm just using my awareness, uh, how do I bridge the gap between my individual awareness <clears throat> and one uh, Satchidananda that is the bedrock of Advaita? That is the, what this verse, Bhagavan is, in this verse, Bhagavan is teaching us the direct path. If you want to know what is Satchidananda, you need to know what you are. 
To know what you are, you need to investigate yourself without forgetfulness. You need to keenly investigate yourself. Investigate yourself so keenly that you see what you actually are. When you see what you actually are, you'll see there is no mind, and therefore there is nothing else. There is just that pure awareness that you actually are. So is it that pure awareness it could still be your individual pure awareness? How does it become the what, one? What do, you, uh, what do you mean by individual pure awareness? Individual means separate. Right. I mean, the whole idea is that... What is, uh, what is separate is forms. So long as the uh, ego rises, it grasps forms. So, so long as there are forms, there is separation. But when ego itself is a formless phantom, when it investigates itself, it merges back into that formless Satchitananda. And in that formless Satchitananda, there is no separation. So there's no such thing as individual pure awareness. Pure awareness means awareness that is aware of nothing other than itself. So there is no separation there. Nothing is separate. Bhagavan describes it beautifully in verse uh, 28 of uh, Upadesh Undia, Anadi, that is beginningless. Ananta means it's endless, limitless, infinite. Akanda, unbroken. It, since it's unbroken, there is no separation. Satchidananda, that is Anadi, Ananta, Akanda, Satchidananda. That is our real nature. That is what we actually are. So, so in a sense that uh, once you have this understanding experientially, your, your love for everybody else is not contrived. It's, it's based on, as Bhagwan says, that uh, yes. you that are is, everyone. That is, when we know ourselves as we actually are, there is no everyone else. There is no other. That is why, that is, because we have risen as ego, we see Bhagavan and we see others. But we see that Bhagavan's love is equal to all. Bhagavan has love for all others. How does he have love for all others? Because he, love, he loves them as himself. Why? Because he sees them as himself. In Bhagavan's view, there are no others. When Bhagavan sees us, he doesn't see Rabbi or he doesn't see Michael. He sees only I am. He sees the react. He sees what we really are, not what we seem to be. So he loves, why he loves everyone equally? His love is equal for the worst sinner and the, the, the greatest saint. For him, all are equal because all are only himself. He doesn't see any differences. He doesn't see any separateness. That's why whoever came to Bhagavan, whether they were rich or poor, educated or uneducated, Everyone felt the love of Bhagavan. Because his love was equal to all. Did he also feel the pain of everybody in the sense that physical? I mean, even after enlightenment, I would think, or that realization, you may think, uh, but you, you could still come down to your ego once in a while and then feel your physical pain. <laughs> you would never be a... But, could you feel somebody else's pain? In our view, Bhagavan, uh -huh. uh, Bhagavan there is no one who is so empathetic as uh -huh. Bhagavan. That is, sometimes people used to come and tell the, the difficulties they were facing in life, about bereavements, about uh, so many difficulties people okay, underwent. They would come and tell Bhagavan. Bhagavan would sometimes shed tears hearing what they're saying. But, so, I mean, Bhagavan could feel the, the, the suffering. That is, it seems to us that Bhagavan could feel the suffering of everyone. That is, but remember, what we, are talk, what we are referring to here as Bhagavan is the person whom Bhagavan seems to be. But what is Bhagavan's fundamental teaching? I am not this person. I am not this body. So, because we see him as a separate person, we see right. him as a person with uh, all-embracing love. A person who is able to empathize with every difficulty that people undergo. That's why his love was equal to all. Even to the worst rogues and sinners, he was the, he, he, his, 
his love was completely impartial. Um, there, there was a devotee, well, he was previously a devotee, um, called um, Paramal Swami. In the days of Skandashram, he was, he was the de facto manager of Skandashram. But later on, people found, people, other devotees didn't, um, found he was being too bossy and he was trying to control everything. So um, he slowly got sort of egg, pu pushed aside. And then eventually he started to put court cases against the ashram. He claimed that Bhagavan was siding with his brother, but he, he was the rightful manager of the ashram, but Bhagavan had sided with his brother. And he also brought in all this caste thing. It's because they're Brahmins, uh, all these things. So he started putting court cases about, against Bhagavan. Uh, and there was, it wasn't just one or two court cases. There were a series of court cases. So once when he, the court, a court case he had put in a lower court had, uh, had failed, he came to Bhagavan and he stood in front of Bhagavan and said, um, just because you won this case, don't think I'm going to leave you. I, I, am going, I will take you to the high court. I'll take you to the highest court in the land. Um, uh, what can you do? Even if you're God as you claim to be, even if you put me in hell, I will not leave you. Bhagavan said, even if you go to hell, I will not leave you. At that time, he didn't understand what Bhagavan meant. But many, many years later, when all the people in the town who for political reasons were supporting him, later all his friends abandoned him and he was left on his own. And towards the end of his life, he came, um, he came, to, he came to the ashram uh, dispensary to, because he, he was sick and he came to the ashram for medicines. And at that time, um, he, uh, uh, Sadhuam was working, was assisting the doctor as a compounder in the dispensary. And he said to Sadhuam, um, I am such a sinner. I, I foolishly, I turned against Bhagavan. But one thing that I know, uh, Bhagavan will, whatever punishment is in store for me, I know Bhagavan will save me. Because he said to me, even if you go to hell, I will not leave you. Why did Bhagavan say he will not leave him? Bhagavan cannot leave any of us because he is that which is shining in each and every one of us as I. His love is equal to all, even to those who give him maximum trouble. He has the same love for every, uh, to them as he has for everyone. So Bhagavan's love is beyond our understanding. Because how can we understand his state when in his view, there are no others. He loved us all as himself because he didn't see us as other than himself. Thank you, Michael. This was wonderful. But we, we see Bhagavan as a person and we try to understand that person. We cannot understand that person so long as we see him as a person because what he actually is, is not the person that he seems to be. He is that which is always shining in us as I am. So if we want to understand Bhagavan properly, if we want to understand Bhagavan's love, if we want to understand Bhagavan's uh, all-embracing compassion, we can do so only by knowing ourselves. Without knowing ourselves, we cannot know Bhagavan. When we know ourselves, that itself is knowing Bhagavan. But in the state where we know ourselves, there's no, we are no longer there as a separate entity. <laughs> We right. lost ourselves in Bhagavan. So in the end, it's only Bhagavan who knows Bhagavan. <laughs> if we want to know Bhagavan, we have to lose ourselves in Bhagavan and be Bhagavan. Yeah, right. That's a riddle. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Michael. Uh, Yazan, do you want to go next? That was such a wonderful story and uh, also a wonderful talk, Michael. Thank you so much. Um, you made a statement that I found a little interesting and um, I think you, you kind of touched upon it, but um, what you said was Bhagavan's teachings are so simple. It's not that people, you know, cannot, even the simplest of uneducated people can understand them, but it's not that they don't understand them. It's that people, the refusal to accept them. So I found that kind of an interesting um, 
listening to say, I think you touched on it a little bit in your response, but I was wondering, you know, in your opinion, um, what would be the primary reason somebody would not accept, you know, something that they, they, they could understand so long in, in, the, in the sense of his teachings? So long as we have attachment for anything other than ourselves, we will not be willing to accept that all this is just a dream. All this is just our own mental projection. See, don't we all have, we, we all have friends, we have relatives, we, people we love. We have so many, so much attachment to these people and everything. So to accept that all this, all these people, and even this, we also have not only attachment to all our friends and relatives, we've got attachment to this person we seem to be. But according to Bhagavan, we are not this person. This person is just a, is as much a part of this dream as all the other people. So, so long as we have attachment to this dream, we are not willing to let go of it. And so long as we're not willing to let go of it, we are not willing to accept Bhagavan's teaching. We may have understood at a certain superficial level. And I'm not talking about others, I'm talking about myself. I see I'm able to talk about these things because I've been studying and trying to practice these things. To a certain extent, I'm able to understand these things. But it's actually very simple. It's not a difficult thing to understand. But when it comes to practice, if, if we really have understood Bhagavan, we will not attend to anything other than ourselves. We'll attend only to ourselves. Because nothing else is real. We'll cling only to what is real. And there's, as Bhagavan said, there's no happiness in anything other than ourselves. So we're all seeking happiness. So if we really were convinced by Bhagavan's teaching, we would cling only to ourselves. So um, even though <coughs> even though we are willing to accept Bhagavan's teachings at a certain level, still our acceptance is still superficial. If we accepted Bhagavan's teachings wholeheartedly, we wouldn't rise to attend to anything else. We would attend only to ourselves and thereby lose ourselves in, in our source. So to, uh, our unwillingness to accept is proportionate to the strength of our desires and attachments. How to overcome those desires and attachments? By, by slowly, slowly, gradually, gradually, gently, gently putting Bhagavan's teachings into practice trying to turn our attention back to ourselves, trying to cling firmly to our, to our fundamental awareness, I am. The more we do so, the more our attachment for other things will, will uh, drop off, and the greater our love just to be as we actually are will, uh, will grow. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. Yeah. It's very um, easy to understand Bhagavan's teachings at the superficial level of the mind. But to be really deeply convinced of them, we need to be willing to accept them wholeheartedly. And if we accept them wholeheartedly, we, the, the sign of accepting them wholeheartedly is not rising as ego, clinging only to what is real, that is, I am. Does that add uh, to your question? He says yes. Thank you, Michael. Um, Sanjay, uh, go ahead, please. Next. Yes. Sir, uh, can we know when our mind has been destroyed? Can we know when our mind has been destroyed? We may fool ourselves by thinking that the mind is destroyed. What <laughs> can show us that we are without the mind? So long as we are thinking that our minds have been destroyed, mind hasn't been destroyed. Because when mind has been destroyed, there'll be no one to think. There'll be no thoughts and no thinker. So long as we are aware of the appearance of multiplicity, mind has not been destroyed. So since I'm talking to you now, I should assume that the, uh, it's still there. The ego and mind is still there. Yes, yes. Yes. How, how could it be otherwise? Or, as Bhagavan says, if ego comes into existence, everything comes into existence. So, so long as we are aware of all this multiplicity, 
Who is it who is aware of it? As ego. What we are in sleep is not aware of all these things. But what we seem to be in waking and dream seems to be aware of all these things. So the mind or ego can never know its own destruction. That which knows the non-existence of mind is the pure awareness, but knows I, I alone am. And that is for, for that pure awareness, the non-existence of the mind isn't a new knowledge. It's what is, the, that is, what we actually are is always aware of itself as it actually is. And is aware that what it actually is, is what alone exists. Nothing else actually exists at all. So when you were in uh, this Tiruvannamalai, there was a Swami called Tinnai Swami. Yes. Tinnai Swami, yes. So he was supposed to have uh, destroyed his mind. But uh, uh, the, uh, but he was considered a, 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 this jnani. Yes. But how could you make out that he is a jnani? Means if he has lost his balance, the mental balance also, he could he could he could behave that way. <laughs> so so but but uh, but people worshipped him like you, sadhu or and all. So what were the signs that made you so sure that his mind has been destroyed? His ego uh, has been destroyed. When we, when we came to Bhagavan, did we come to Bhagavan to find out who is a jnani? We came to Bhagavan to find out who are we. Until we know what we are, we cannot know who is jnani, who is not jnani. But from our, from our, um, from our perspective as ego, Tine Swami were... <laughs> I, I can't say. There's no. I, I cannot give any logical proof to say, but uh, to prove that Tene Swami was a jnani. Obviously, I can't. But um, it is. It's a. It's a belief. It's a belief. It's you. 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 We, we, there's certain things we can't. As I was saying to you yesterday, or whenever we were last talking, there are certain things we can't understand with our head. We can understand only with our heart. There's some things we just feel to be the case. We may be mistaken, we don't know, but there's certain things which we, which it just feels. If you had seen Tine Swami, I think you would also feel the same. That, that's all I can say. But uh, and in addition to that, uh, uh, Sadhu Om indicated very clearly when he talked about Tene Swami, but Tene Swami was firmly established in even, I think it's even in one of the videos uh, 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 that we took in those days. They weren't videos, they were old movie camera, a friend brought from America. And I, um, I ended up using, doing most of the filming of uh, Giri production and everything. And we also did filming of Tene Swami. And in one video, Sadhu Om says um, that, uh, he, Tene Swami is in the state of uh, Brahma Varya or Varishta, as we can classify. So, I mean, that's just one example. But I mean, Tene uh, Sadhu made it very clear. But when Bhagavan said that one word to Tene Swami, Iru, that is established him in his own real state. And that was all that story um, Sadhu heard from Murugana. So, um, I think. When both Murugan and Sadhu Homs say that Tine Swami is in that state, I don't think we need to doubt it. But if we want to doubt it, it doesn't matter. But one that doesn't ask us to, to decide whether so-and-so is a jnani or not a jnani. But one asks us to find out who are you. Sometimes mm -hmm. when people ask Bhagavan, is such and such a person a jnani or not a jnani? Bhagavan said, there is only one jnani, and you are that. Know yourself and you'll know the jnani. Until you know yourself, you cannot know the jnani. So and before to say, um, uh, um, jnana may jnani. Jnana may means jnana alone is the jnani. What is it? That's a very deep uh, meaning that. Jnana means that pure awareness. Pure awareness alone knows pure awareness. What else can know pure awareness? Pure awareness cannot be an object known by us. That's why he says in verse 33 of uh, Uluru Napadu, to say I have, I, 
I have not known myself or I have known myself. Both are a matter of ridicule. Are there two selves for oneself to be an object known by the other? To make oneself an object, are there two selves? For example, the experience of all of us is being one. So self-knowledge, self-awareness is our real nature. We are always that. All we need to do is to remove the upadis, remove the agnana, uh, adjuncts, and what remains is the, is the, is the ever-shining jnana. In verse 13 of Ulinapri, Bhagavan says, jnana me, jnana mam tane me, oneself who is jnana alone is real. So we are already that. What we need to do is to, to cease mistaking ourselves to be Michael or Sanjay or anyone else. Remove the adjuncts, knowing oneself without adjunct, is knowing God, Bhagavan says in um, verse 20, uh, 25 of, of Upadesh Undia. So all we need to do is to remove the adjunct. How to remove the adjunct? By clinging to what is real, by clinging to the pure awareness, I am. The adjuncts will then drop off of their own accord, and what will remain is just I am. Until then, trying to decide whether this person is a jnani or not, or questioning whether he's a jnani or not, or how can we know whether he's a jnani or not, these are all, this is all anatma vichara. This is all investigating things other than ourselves. But one always discouraged anatma vichara. Because what is the use of knowing anything other than ourselves? When we don't know ourselves, knowing all other things is useless. When we know ourselves, there's nothing else to know. He says very clearly in um, in um, Anma Vidya. So did you meet did you meet Tinai Swami before he had his self experience? Before yes. and after? No, I think that from what Sadhuam told me and what Murugan told Sadhuam, that one word Bhagavan said to Murugana, Iru, just be, that established Tine Swami in that state. So ever yeah. since then, he was in that state. So that would have been about 1948, 49. Okay, okay. So that was before, I, before this body was born, so. Okay, okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, Sanjay. Um, there is a question, um, uh, anonymous. Um, what is the original purpose of the mind? And can it be repurposed to help on the path to its own destruction? <clears throat> the only purpose of the mind is to see that there's no mind at all. That is, um, what is the purpose of the snake? But snake has no purpose. The snake is just an illusion. It doesn't actually exist at all. So likewise, mind doesn't actually exist at all. It has no purpose. But, if, but since it seems to exist, if you want to attribute a purpose to it, its only purpose is to find out that it doesn't exist. Um, people often used to ask Bhagavan, why did the ego rise in the first place and bring all this trouble? Bhagavan said that's the wrong question. Because when you ask why did it, ego arise, you're assuming ego rises. Rather than asking whether ego, why ego has risen, look and see whether ego has risen even now. If you look for this ego, you won't find anything. Paid in our lotum pinnacle, it's thought it takes flight. So we, we seem to be ego or mind only so long as we're looking at things other than ourselves. If we look at ourselves, there is no such thing as ego or mind. Right. So since there's no such thing, you can't attribute purpose to something that doesn't exist. What is the purpose of the birth of the son of the barren woman? Can you answer that question? <laughs> right. There's no such thing as the son of a barren woman. Because if she's barren, she has no children. If she has a son, she is not barren. So uh, uh, the son of a barren woman is something that can never exist. Likewise, according to Bhagavan, his ego is maya. And maya means ya ma, what is not, what never exists. So we cannot explain what doesn't exist. And, and the second... What does exist needs no explanation. 
because in ex to explain something, you can only explain A in terms of B. You, know, you need something. If, if you want to explain something, you can explain it in terms of other things. But since what actually exists alone exists, there is nothing to explain about you. They, they, there can be no explanation for it. it. Is because it is. That's all we can say. We are because we are. I am because I am. Thank you. Uh, then the second part of that question was, can it be, meaning the mind, be repurposed to help on the path to its own destruction? Uh, yes. That's what, this is what Bhagavan asks us to do. The natural the natural flow of the mind, the natural inclination of the mind is to go outwards, to be constantly attending to things other than itself. So we can say the, the, the nature of the mind is to attend to things other than itself. We need to repurpose that, to train this mind to attend to itself. Because we, the mind is what we seem to be so long as we attend to anything other than ourselves. When we attend to ourselves, my, this mind will cease to be mind, and what will remain is just pure awareness. Because what is it that now seems to be mind? It is only ourself as pure awareness. We are, we are pure awareness. Now we seem to be mind. So if we know what we actually are, this mind will thereby dissolve, or cease to exist. In fact, it won't even cease to exist. As Bowen says in this verse, it doesn't exist at all. But in order to see that it doesn't exist, we need to investigate it. So we can repurpose the mind by, by, by turning its direction. Instead of inwards. allowing the mind to continue going outwards, we need to redirect it back within. This isn't going to happen all of a sudden because we have been going outwards with so much, um, so much momentum. That we, the momentum of our... Um, of our desires and attachments, driving this mind out with so much speed. So we've slowly got to apply the brakes and turn around. How we apply the brakes is by constantly trying little by little to turn our attention back towards ourselves. The more we turn our attention back towards the, ourselves, the more we are applying the brakes and enabling the whole vehicle to turn around. So just like it's natural now for the mind to be going outwards, Outward means away from ourselves towards other things. We must change the nature of the mind. We must repurpose the mind to make its direction go. Instead of going from out, in to out, back within. From Thank you, Michael. In. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Satya, do you want to ask a question? That will be, I guess, the last question for today. Uh, unmute, please. There you go. Namaste. Uh, mine is a more of a comment uh, mixed with a question. Uh, quite often we hear that educated people could not understand what Ramana Maharshi was telling them. Uh, I think uh, the definition of education comes into question. That there are different types of knowledge not everything is the same knowledge. Knowledge of self is different from the knowledge of physics, chemistry, biology, physiology, anatomy, or whatever other it can be, whatever it may other be. Uh, I think uh, that's uh, uh, our expectation that because somebody is uh, well educated or became a professor in a particular branch of science, that he would know all about science. So the knowledge of self is, is a unique and uh, it's not the same as the science of uh, physics or chemistry or biology. The second thing is uh, we are also mixing uh, upper vidya with the paravidyas. The paravidya is this knowledge of the self and uh, upper vidya is the science the knowledge of the sciences. Uh, do you agree with me on that subject? Yeah, that is, um, it, it, it is not true to say, but education prevents us from understanding Bhagavan's teachings. Um, 
Tine Swami, for example, who Sanjay was asking me about, he was, before uh, coming to Bhagavan, he was a professor of biochemistry in Madras Medical College. So he was very, very well educated. Not only did he, was he a professor of biochemistry, he was also uh, very good in languages. His, um, he was born in Coimbatore, but to a Telugu, in a Telugu Brahmin family. So he knew Telugu, he knew Tamil, he knew English, he knew French, he knew a number of languages. Um, um, when he was studying in college, he just had an interest to learn French. So he learned French and apparently he could speak French fluently. But he, in all the time I heard him, um, sometimes you could hear some mixture of languages, but I mean, a lot of the time what he was talking, you couldn't understand. But um, people who knew him earlier said he could speak French fluently. So he, had learned, he, he was a very well-educated person. But when he came to Bhagavan, he understood the simplicity of Bhagavan's teachings. And because he was a ripe soul, just one word from Bhagavan was sufficient. Bhagavan, when he, he, what had, his story was, but he, he had visited Bhagavan and spent some time with Bhagavan, and then he'd gone back to Chennai. And um, according to the, his uh, seniority, he had been selected to go to America for, um, for some uh, postdoctoral uh, research in Duke University. Um, and um, that had been confirmed and he was due to go, but due to some politics within the department, some person junior to him was able to get, um, was able to get him himself sent instead of uh, Tine Swami. So since, since this, was a, this was a blatant case of, um, of, uh, of politics interfering with science, he, on, on principle, he resigned his uh, job in Madras Medical College. And he came and he spent some months with Bhagavan. And then there was a job opportunity for him in Pondicherry, um, in the medical college in Pondicherry or whatever it was. So he, he had received that offer and he was planning to go. So he went to Bhagavan and, uh, and said, Bhagavan, I got this job offer, I'm going to Pondicherry. Usually if anyone said to Bhagavan that they were leaving, Bhagavan would say, it would just nod. But unusually Bhagavan said to him, Iru. Iru in that context means be or wait. So he, Bhagavan was indicating to him not to go. So anyone in the hall at that time who heard Bhagavan saying Iru would have thought, oh, that's unusual. Bhagavan tells him not to go. Um, but people didn't attach any more importance to it. The person who understood what Bhagavan meant by Iru and the effect that that one word Iru had on uh, Tine Swami was Murugana who was present. And Murugana told, uh, later told uh, uh, Sadhu Om, but when Bhagavan said that one word Iru, that completely transformed Tine Swami. The implication is that that one word was sufficient to establish him in his own real state because he was such a mature soul. So in spite of all his education, he was able to understand that Bhagavan better than any of us. So it is not a matter, education is not an advantage. And if we are too much attached to our learning, it, it can be a disadvantage. But if we're not attached to our learning, if we're ready to, to set aside all that we have learned, if we are ready in Bhagavan's terms to unlearn everything, if we're ready to give up all our beliefs in everything, other than I am, because what is real is actually only I am. If, if we are ready to simplify our understanding so much, then we are ready for Bhagavan, whether we're educated or not. Regarding what you say about the different, uh, um, different branches of learning, yes, there are so many uh, branches of learning. But, uh, science is different, um, history is different, uh, philosophy is different, there are so many different branches of learning. But even people who are very, very learned, for example, you would think people who are learned in, um, in the Advaita uh, texts, in all the, um, in, um, the Upanishads, the Brahma Sutra and Bhagavad Gita and the commentaries by Shankara and all those sort of uh, Advaitic texts, you would think they, were, um, they would be very suitable for this path. But it is not necessarily so. Some people who are very, very learned they're still not ready to accept the simplicity of Bhagavan's teachings because 
over the years, Advaita became an extremely complicated philosophy because Advaita, in the, a thousand years ago in India, there were many systems of philosophy, Astika ones and Nastika ones. That is, the Astika ones were the, 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 the the ones who accepted the Vedas, the Nastika ones who didn't, all these different philosophies, the Buddhist, the Jain, and the Astika philosophies, they were all competing with each other. So in order to, if you're, if you're arguing with other schools of thought, you need to have arguments suitable to counteract their arguments. So because the Advaitins were attacked by everyone, they had to bring in more and more elaborate arguments to defend their Advaita. So if you, you read some Advaitic texts, they're full of so many explanations and detailed uh, analogies and explanation. It's, it's very, very complicated. Whereas Bhagavan has brought out the simple essence that is Advaita is the essence. The essence of the Vedas is Vedanta. The essence of Vedanta is Advaita. The essence of Advaita is Bhagavan's teachings. So Bhagavan, the, 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 the nectar churned out of the ocean of milk of the Vedas is Bhagavan's teachings. So we, it doesn't matter how educated we are, how, much, how many uh, Advaitic texts we've read, that doesn't mean that we're necessarily going to be willing to accept the simple teachings of Bhagavan. So it's all, it's not, it got nothing to do with education. Education is neither an advantage nor a disadvantage. What is an advantage, what is a disadvantage is attachment. What is, a, um, what is an advantage is detachment. So to the extent to which we are willing to detach ourselves from all our learning, from all our beliefs, from all that we know and are ready to cling to Bhagavan has said one thing alone is real. Bhagavan is saying the essence of, Ad of Advaita here. One thing alone is real. Oh, he says in, in Nana, Yatatamai Ulludu Atma Surupamondre. What actually exists is only the real nature of oneself. So if we are ready to accept that and to cling only to ourself, to know what we actually are, then then we will understand Bhagavan correctly. If we are unwilling to do so, if we are still attached to other things, then we won't understand. So this, this, uh, this aparavidya requires complete detachment, absolute veragya. Because only when we are free of all attachment will we be willing to attach ourselves to what is real. Most of us now, we, we have what, what we consider our position we have been attracted to Bhagavan's teachings, but we still haven't let go of all our other attachments. So we are midway between this and that. So how do we, how do we learn to shed our attachments by following the path, simple path of self-investigation and self-surrender that Bhagavan has taught us? That is by clinging more and more to this fundamental awareness I am. To the extent we cling to that, to that extent our attachments will drop off and our love to be as we actually are will increase. So ultimately, it's got nothing to do with education. Education is neither an advantage nor a disadvantage. Because both the educated person and the uneducated person, both are equally aware I am. Thank you, Michael, yeah. Um, I think that was a good explanation. And that, that was a good question too, Satya. Yeah. Satya, are you satisfied with the, with the reply? Have I replied to your question adequately? Yes, uh, I'm fully satisfied with that. As a matter of fact, uh, in my own case, uh, the difficulty is differentiating between uh, the three states, uh, uh, the projected reality, absolute reality, and uh, vyavaharika, transactional uh, empirical reality. Uh, I think uh, because quite often the confusion is because we mix uh, uh, absolute reality with uh, uh, empirical reality and uh, they are not one and the same. They're not one and the same. But uh, um, in, in, in some Advaitic texts, they talk about three, three levels of reality. That is the Paramatika Satya, that's the absolute reality. 
the Bibiharika Satya, that is the transactional reality of this present waking state. And they distinguish this from, uh, Pati, um, from um, is it Pratibhasika Satya? The, the, what's Presented it? reality? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that, that is uh, the seeming reality of, of, of dream. But according yeah. to Bhagavan, what we take to be the waking state is nothing but a dream. So Vivaharika Satya and, um, oh, the word has slipped my mind. Is it Pratibhasika Satya? Pratibhasika Satya. Mm. Pratibhasika, yes. Pratibhasika, okay, yes. I, okay, Pratibhasika means what is the seeming reality. Yes. But according to Bhagavan, what we take to be Vivaharika Satya is actually just pra Pratibhasika Satya because what we take to be waking is just a dream. So there's, there's only the real, what is actually real, which is the Paramatika Satya, and what is seemingly real, which is all these dreams. So, so the, the, the seeming reality is what exists in the view of ourself as ego. When we are looking outwards, when we look within, what exists is only I am, and that is Paramatika Satya. The uh, that also. So the whole classification is not needed if you understand the true definition of reality according yes, to Bhagavan. Yes, there, ultimately there is only Paramatika Satya. Exactly, there is a, what what always exists, whatever shines, is the only reality. But now they see all the all this seems to be real. Why does all this seem to be real? It's very important to understand why our current dream always seems to be real. Because in any dream, we experience ourselves as a body. So long as we, what is actually real is only ourself. When we uh, mistake ourselves to be a body, we are mistaking that body to be real because we are real. So if, if this body is I, and since I am real, this body is real. And since this body is a part of this world, the whole world seems to be real. So always the current dream always seems to be real. But when we leave one dream and come to another dream, our identification with the body of the previous dream is broken. And as soon as we so-called wake up from a dream, that is when we come from one dream to another dream, we recognize that the previous state was just a dream. So long as we were dreaming it, it seemed to be real. When we when we lead that dream and come to this dream, it no longer seems to be real. Why? Because our identification with that dream body has been severed. As soon as we cease to experience that dream body as I, we are able to recognize that whole dream world was, was just a mental projection. Whether we're educated or uneducated, even uneducated people are able to recognize when they wake up from a dream, oh, that was just a dream, it wasn't real. So, so long as we are dreaming, the dream seems every bit as real as this state. So sometimes in dream, things happen, like we are able to fly, for example. Though we know, it's again the law of physics to fly, but when we find ourselves flying, that is more real than all the laws of physics that tell us we can't fly. And, or sometimes in a dream, we meet some friend or relative or parent who passed away many, many years before. We, we meet them in our dream. Though we may remember, oh, they passed away. But still, because we're actually seeing them there in front of us in flesh and blood, the, what we are seeing in that dream is more real than our memory of the fact that they have passed away. So we dismiss the memory that they passed away or somehow they come back to life again anyway. It, 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 the dream is so convincing so long as we're experiencing it. Even though our mind may tell us, no, it's not, this can't be so, but still we, we, the, the, we are unable to doubt the reality of the dream while, because the, the, dream, the, the dream body, the body that we are then experiencing as I, seems to us to be real. So the whole world of which that body is just a small part seems to be real. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, um, what is uh, real is only I. Because I alone is real, 
That is what we should attend to. That's all Bhagavan asks us to do. Right. Why? That is the beginning and the end of his teachings. <laughs> Thank you, Michael. So one last question. Um, what is the role of despair or hopelessness on this path? If we look outside of this world, we have every reason to despair. Because however nicely our life may be going now, one thing we can all be sure, this body is going to die one day. So all our achievements in this life, all our learning, all our wealth, all our um, good relations and our friendships and everything that we hold dear in this life, one day we're going to have to say goodbye to it all. So the, the, there's every reason for despair if we take all this to be real. But what is real? What is actually real? If we are ready to accept what Bhagavan has taught us, what is real is only I am. And why is I am real? Because it's that which exists and shines always by its own light, without ever undergoing any change. Bhagavan often used to define reality as what is eternal, that is beyond time. It doesn't just mean lasting throughout time, mm -hmm. but that is beyond time. So uh, eternal, unchanging. No, so not in, uh, never undergoing any change whatsoever. Eternal, unchanging, and self-shining. That only that which shines by its own light, that which is aware of its own existence, that is real. So what is what is it? What is eternal, unchanging, and self-shining is only our fundamental awareness. I am our awareness of our own existence. So that alone is real. So since we are always that, we have no reason to despair. So if we look outwards, we've got every reason to despair. If we look inwards, we have no reason to despair. So dis none of us like to, to feel despair is a very unpleasant feeling to feel despair. So if we are wise, we should leave despair behind and cling to that which is real, which is I am. So if, if despair drive this verb to turn back within to find what is real, then it has a purpose. But so long as we are wallowing in our despair, we're allowing our mind to go outwards. So what is the purpose of the appearance of this world and everything in this world? Only to remind us, I am, and to turn our attention to within. So that's so, so can a mind in despair turn within? And the answer is yes, right? I mean, so long as we are clinging to despair, no, because despair is something other than ourselves. We are not always in a state of despair. Despair is one of the many phenomena that appear and disappear. We may be throughout our waking state. We may be feeling uh, we may be feeling terrible despair. Sooner or later, we'll be too tired to continue feeling despair. We'll go to sleep. Have you? Has anyone ever felt any despair in sleep? So since no. despair cannot prevent us falling asleep, it may, it may delay our falling asleep, but ultimately we'll, our tiredness will overcome the despair and we'll fall asleep. So since it cannot prevent us falling asleep, it cannot prevent us turning our mind within. So long as we cling to the despair, so long as we want to wallow in despair, then it's an obstacle. But if, we, if it motivates us to know who am I who is feeling this despair? Because a, a little bit of discrimination is required. Well, that, that's what I was focusing on, yeah. Have we always felt despair? Despair is something that, is, that comes and goes. We haven't felt despair throughout our life. But there have been times in life when life looks, um, everything looks rosy and things are going well and we've got all sorts of hopes and plans for the future and everything then we're not in a state of despair. So just like our, our hopes and our plans come and go, the despair comes and goes. Whatever comes and goes is not real. What is real is what is ever present. What is ever present is only I am. So if we want to overcome despair, cling to what is ever present, that is I am. Thank so you, Michael. Whatever negative feeling we may feel, whether it's despair or depression or 
uh, whatever it may be, or bereavement or anything. So one way to overcome all these feelings is to cling to I am. But in order for this, this is the remedy given by Bhagavan. In order to take this remedy, we must be willing to let go of everything else. So long as we are clinging to a despair, clinging to the depression, clinging to um, the negative thoughts or the whatever it may be, we are, we, are, we are avoiding taking the medicine. To take the medicine, we need to be ready to turn and face within. Namaskaram and thank you, Michael. Okay. Not, namaskaram, thank you so much, Michael. Right. This was so, so, so informative. Thank you so much. Okay, well, it's all thanks thank you. you. I, I'm, just a, I'm just a parrot. I repeat mm. what I love from Bhagavan. So uh, all thanks are only due to Bhagavan because he is the source of all this clarity. What I would say to that is I would remove the word just. <laughs> and I'm thanking you for being the messenger. I, I, would I get stick about to the word source. Just because there is just Bhagavan. We are not. There is just Bhagavan. Okay. <laughs>